Hello and welcome to an Alzheimer's Society of Calgary uh, Facebook video talk. I'm Paul Bartell, Manager of Learning and Support Services and joining me today is... Padma Ganesh, Learning Specialist. And we're here to talk today about a question we hear a lot from people who have uh, Alzheimer's disease or dementia in their family and that's the question about the risk of inheriting the condition. Uh, and this is actually a really, really complex question, uh, one that's quite uh, difficult to approach. Now we talk about there being two forms of yes. Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. There's a familial form and a sporadic form. Mm -hmm. what, what are the relative percentages of those two forms? Yeah, so as you said correctly, there's this a familial variety and there's the non-familial or the sporadic variety. And of all cases of Alzheimer's disease, only 0.6% is purely familial which okay. means that the vast majority of Alzheimer's disease is a non-familial sporadic variety that is, uh, that's happening because of a complex interplay of lifestyle, environmental and genetic factors. Okay, so genetics are at play then in both forms. Absolutely. So let's maybe talk a bit about them uh, in the role of genetics then in each form. Yes. Uh, the, so the familial form is the one that I think most of us would immediately assume mm -hmm. that's, that's where you could inherit it or where genetics play the strongest yeah. role. Is that, is yeah. that right? Yeah, absolutely, because people are worried about that. You know, if there's a family member with a disease, what is my risk of getting the disease? So this is something that we have to be very clear about. Um, the familial variety of Alzheimer's disease is actually caused by mutations in any of the three genes, amyloid precursor protein gene, or called, which is otherwise called the APP gene, the presenlin one gene, and the presenlin two genes. And together, these three genes contribute to about 10% of young onset dementia. That only 10% of young onset dementia that happens in people under the age of 65 years. Okay. okay? And of among all the, these three different genes, the majority of familial Alzheimer's disease is caused by the presenlin gene mutation. The APP gene mutation contributes to only less than 1%. Okay. of uh, all cases of familial Alzheimer's disease. And what the presenilin gene does, it's actually, um, it causes breakdown, abnormal breakdown of the amyloid precursor protein gene, uh, protein, amyloid precursor protein, to its toxic uh, beta amyloid form. Okay, and which is what forms the plaques. Exactly, that's the, the, the toxic aggregates of beta amyloid is at the center of the amyloid plaques and also the inflammation in the brain that drives the Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so what role then does genetics play in the sporadic form? Yeah, in, in the sporadic variety actually, um, 26 susceptibility genes have been identified. Okay. And those are different from the three? Different from the three familial genes, 26 other okay. susceptibility genes have been identified. And of these, the strongest uh, risk gene is the APOE genotype. Okay. And the APOE gene, um, its role is it regulates the uh, lipoprotein metabolism uh, that binds to the soluble amyloid in the brain okay. and influences its aggregation in the brain to form the plaques and also its clearance from the brain. Okay. So that is the role of the um, uh, APOE gene. And uh, what we see is that APOE gene, um, it, can, it occurs in three different forms, APOE E2, it's found in about 8.4%, 8.4% of the population, and it is protective. Okay, okay so it actually, re it if reduces, you have that form yeah, it's of it, protective. it, re it reduces your, your risk. risk. Yeah, okay. Definitely. And APOE E3 gene, uh, it's seen in about 78% uh, of the population, 77.978% of the population, and it is neutral. So no role. Okay. Okay. And APOE E4 instead, um, it is found in about 13.7% uh, of the population and it adds to your risk, it increases your risk of developing the disease. Okay. So and but, but, can I add something here? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I want to say that having one copy, so what's the importance of having one, you know, difference between having one copy of the APOE4 versus two copies. Okay. So having one copy of APOE4 gene is associated with roughly three times higher risk of developing the non-familial variety of Alzheimer's disease. Okay. Okay, compared to having E2 or E3. While having two copies of APOE4 gene is associated with roughly 10 times higher risk of developing the um, non-familial variety of Alzheimer's disease 
compared to having E2 or E3 gene. Okay. And again, another thing that, that researchers have found was that is found out is that female carriers of APOE E4 gene have much higher risk uh, of developing the disease compared to male carriers, especially between the ages of 65 to 75. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so we talked in that sporadic form in that mm -hmm. APOE gene mm -hmm. that it increases your risk yeah. by a certain percentage. Yeah. With the genes that we talked about in the familial form, if you have one of those, if you've gotten one of those mm -hmm. from one of your parents, yeah. are you guaranteed that you're going to get Alzheimer's yeah, disease? Is, or? Okay, great question. So there's, there's, uh, you're at least, you know, if you're having a genetic risk, you, familial, um, the familial uh, genetic mutation, then um, you have about 60% uh, greater risk compared to someone who does not have the disease. And this is because of the moderating influences of the other lifestyle factors, you know, if you are uh, physically active, if you are uh, cognitively active, you are following a healthy diet. So there's moderating influences from other lifestyle factors and other health conditions. So um, we could say that purely at least 60% of higher risk you have okay. of getting the familial disease if you have the yeah, one of the three genetic mutations. Okay. So if I can try to summarize, because mm -hmm. that's a lot of information for me. Um, having some of these genes or any of these genes m may increase your risk. Absolutely. But it doesn't guarantee that you're going to get it. Uh, absolutely, yeah. And in the, in what the difference then between the, fam the genes involved in the familial form and the genes involved in the sporadic form is that the familial form genes always increase risk. Absolutely. But the genes involved in the sporadic form may, in fact, offer a, a protective influence or, or something that reduces your risk in some of their in some of their variants in, in a way because as we said for the sporadic variety there are 26 genes that have been identified of these we said the one apoe gene is definitely going to increase the risk apoe e4 gene definitely going to increase the risk um, but the other 25 genes they contribute to the risk in different ways you know so in small small ways so we are not exactly sure some of them might have a moderating influence and along with that if we add all the lifestyle factors uh, they could be the, the, the effect is something that we cannot predict okay yeah. so this is why this is such a complex question and mm -hmm. the the genetic factors at play here take on a lot of different forms and contribute in a lot of different ways. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, the other question that often comes with this for the, for the families we're working with is, mm -hmm. what about genetic testing? Yeah. Uh, and is that a possibility and what does what kind of role can that play? All right. So if you look at, uh, you know, how, what is available at this point of time, um, there is no, um, there is no accurate predictive testing for the non-familial variety of Alzheimer's disease. Okay. And uh, so it's not recommended doing that APOE gene testing is not recommended anywhere in the world. Um, basically because APOE gene is not a deterministic gene, it is only uh, a susceptibility gene or a risk gene. Okay. But on the other hand, uh, there is, um, you know, if you are worried about your risk of developing familial variety of Alzheimer's disease that runs in your family, uh, then it is available. Familial uh, genetic testing is available, especially in cases where there is a strong and clear family history of the disease happening in different generations, in multiple um, generations. And also if the symptoms are kind of atypical, not characteristic symptoms and appearing at a, um, a younger age, then there's a clear indication for doing uh, the familial uh, genetic testing but for the sporadic, the non-familial variety of genetic, uh, for, for that variety of Alzheimer's disease, genetic testing is not recommended. Okay. Um, if you look at the utility value, that's also very important before we jump into, you know, getting all caught up in genetic testing and getting that done, um, the, the utility value is actually very limited because it's not, genetic testing for Alzheimer's disease is not the same as doing a blood test for um, vitamin B12 deficiency or doing a blood test for anemia because those tests are definite, a definitive test, conclusive, and there's also treatment, cure available. Right. Whereas, whereas when we look at the genetic testing for Alzheimer's disease, uh, that because of all these moderating influences, it is not definite and conclusive, uh, first of all. And secondly, uh, there is no cure at this point of time that's available. 
Um, so if, when, if you are actually jumping into that, uh, getting that test done uh, and you are found to be positive, you are living the rest of your life in constant fear. Yes. Of you know whatever memory lapse you are having, you are always saying, "Oh my God, is it the disease?" So the so it's very important to think about the first of all the limited utility of this test, and also the impact it can have on your personal life, on yourself, on your family life, your spouse, your kids, the extended family, and also it's very important to remember that you could be putting yourself at risk of discrimination. Uh, that affects your ability to buy property to get insurance uh, you know to uh, finance to plan financially for the future so all we have to be very careful when we uh, when before we jump into doing that testing we have to think through that the pros and cons of what is the benefit of doing the testing so um, i would suggest to anyone who is worried about their risk of developing the disease i would suggest it is much better to focus your efforts on risk reduction what can you do, regardless of whether you have the risk gene or not, what can you do to mitigate the effect of these risk genes? Okay. Well, and maybe let's talk a bit about that. Uh, so, regardless of your genetic profile, mm -hmm. there are things you can do to reduce your risk. Absolutely. And, and what, are, what, are, what are sort of the things that people should be doing? Okay. So, even if you, are, um, you have a strong family history of the disease and you have the risk gene for the familial variety, even then, um, you know, so you have, as I said, you have 60% higher risk compared to the rest of the population for getting the disease. But this amount of risk can be um, can be significantly reduced by focusing on lifestyle low risk, healthy uh, lifestyle strategies. You can okay. significantly reduce this risk and bring it to a much lower value. Okay. Uh, for example, physical fitness. Maintaining high levels of intellectual activity throughout life and following a Mediterranean diet. These have been associated with um, fewer plaques and tangles in the brain, uh, then reduced shrinking of the brain that happens with age, better cognition at, in, at a later stage in life, and also delayed onset of symptoms. So even if you are destined to get it, you are able to push the disease to a much later stage of your life. So you are able to live a good quality of life for longer. With, yeah, for longer period of time and, and comfortably without fear. Okay? Right. Yeah, and uh, very recently researchers have reported they have come up with five things that you know, all of us can do to significantly reduce our risk of developing the disease, whether it is um, the familial variety or the sporadic variety. And these five things to focus on are one is the physical activity, regular physical activity. Okay. Secondly, maintaining high levels of intellectual activity throughout life. Thirdly, following a Mediterranean diet. Fourthly, not smoking. Okay. And uh, fifth is limiting alcohol intake. So these three things have, researchers have things. come up as the five things that will help you to significantly reduce your risk. And the um, fact is that each additional um, low risk strategy, lifestyle strategy that you're adopting, it will bring down your risk further. Okay. Yeah, so by so adopting just, each one, not just these, if you can keep your blood pressure, your diabetes, your blood sugar, your cholesterol values in the normal range, you are decreasing your risk even further. Treating hearing loss or depression, as soon as it happens, you are decreasing the risk further. So that is the value of uh, the risk reduction strategies. And of these five strategies, the researchers have said that even following four of these, if you don't want to give up alcohol or if you don't want to give up smoking, okay, at least four of these, if you can strictly follow, that can help you reduce the risk by minimum of 59%. Okay. Yeah. So, so what, what I, how I would like to conclude is that, of course, there is a higher risk um, of uh, getting the disease if you have a risk gene, or especially for the familial Alzheimer's disease. But at the same time, the important thing to remember is that rather than being carried away with the genetic testing, Focus your efforts and energy and time on what you can do at this point of time to reduce your risk. Because uh, as we have seen through research, even for the familial as well as the sporadic non-familial variety of Alzheimer's disease, lifestyle factors can help us in significantly lowering our risk and will enable us to live the rest of our life without fear. Great. Yeah. That's wonderful. It's good to know that there's things we can do. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, if you have any questions on this topic or any other, please feel free to reach out to us at either 
290-0110 or email us at findsupport at alzheimercalgary.ca. We'll be back in two weeks with another video. If you have questions on any topic you think we should try to address in these videos, please let us know with a comment below and we'll do our best to do that. And we'll see you again in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you.